So we're going to be finishing up the book of Daniel. It's been, a, amen, amen. At least I hope so. Um, it's been a privilege to be able to share out of this great book. Daniel is a great man of God, great example. And of course, you know, Daniel is somebody who, who lived in a time of exile. You know, I think of what Peter said in 1 Peter. He called, he called those that he was writing to sojourners. In a sense, he called them exiles as well. Those that were part of the, the dispersion. And, and to some you know, degree, we, we live on this world. We live by the power of God, by his grace. But this world is not yet under the full banner, the full kingdom, authority of God. We are. And the more we spread the gospel the more this world has a chance, has hope. And Daniel, in a way, was operating under the same premise in that he lived and he started out. He started out as a young man, and now he's, ended, he's ending his life as an elderly gentleman in the faith, somebody that we can look at his life and we can learn much from it. You know, Daniel lived... During his life, a time of suffering, a time of difficulty, a time of tribulation. And this world today has much persecution, suffering, and tribulation in it. Difficulties. This last weekend and what's been going on uh, really for the last several years. There's, there's war. Hot wars going on where people where they're suffering and pain. There are rumors of war going on where we hear things and we're not sure. Is this going to escalate into war? Like Last weekend, or this last weekend, and really even last night, where there are bombs going off, but not quite a full-scale war yet. And of course, we as believers, we pray for peace. We pray for God's will. We pray for people to do what God has called uh, to be done. And we pray that people during this time um, would, be, would, get, would be saved. The thing is, is as difficult as it is and as much tribulation and suffering as there is, we, we know that it is not what the Bible calls the great tribulation. There will be in the future a great tribulation, one that will be the consummation of all things. And that's what Daniel talks about in Daniel chapter 12, this final chapter, this final statement of the Holy Spirit through Daniel, this now man who is soon to go to be with the Lord. And so I want to just do really quickly a, a summary or a kind of a, a review, an overview, and then we'll get into some of the points, some of the observations, the general, really general observations of the Great Tribulation. And we as believers know how to pray and know what we can be looking for. And so first, by observation. Daniel, as a young man, probably 15 to 16, he lived during the time when the time of the Gentiles began. I've talked about this. When the Babylonians came in and conquered Jerusalem in 606 BC, and then ultimately destroyed the temple in 586 BC. And so Daniel lived during the time, lived, he, he actually lived before the time of the Gentiles, but he lived during the time of the beginning of the Gentiles, when Jerusalem was not under Jewish or Judean control or under the control of the king, uh, king uh, the Davidic line. And so we see a, a map here, a graph here, the time of the Gentiles. And so that's where our book begins. And Daniel in Daniel chapter 2, he prophesied, or I should say he received a vision of the Lord. And that vision showed him, showed him these, these four kingdoms that would ultimately lead to the coming of the Messiah. Babylon, where he started now as the elderly man in Daniel chapter 12. He's already living through the beginning of the Persian Empire. Then the Greek Empire, which we talked about last, last time in Daniel chapter 11. And it was from the Greek Empire and these Greek civil wars that we had the type of the Messiah. And we also had the layout of the type of the Messiah in Antiochus IV. And then that layout of who the anti-Messiah would be that anti-Messiah who would come and who would persecute the people of God, the Jewish people. Then we have the Daniel chapter 9, where Daniel received from uh, the angel Gabriel and from God through the angel Gabriel, he received a message of the coming of the Messiah. The coming of the Messiah, a very powerful and important messianic prophecy. 
And this prophecy, you could see beginning in, in 444 BC. So before Daniel, after Daniel would already be passed away, there would be a decree that would start the counting of when the Messiah would enter Jerusalem on that we call Palm Sunday or Lamb Selection Day, the 10th of Nisan, which even though it says 33 AD, when I preached, I had it specifically to April 10th. <laughs> 32 AD, how's that for organization for you? Right there. But you know what? I'm willing to say it could be 33, uh, it could be 31, uh, but that's where we have in, in the calculations. And that's, though these messages are online, are online. So, so uh, on our YouTube channel. So you can see the coming of the Messiah, the calculation, the 69 weeks. And then, and then there would be a gap from the 69th week. Oh, went too far there. Okay. A gap from the 69th week until the 70th week. And that gap is the church age. So after Yeshua died for our sins, buried, rose again, he spent 40 days really discipling and training and giving that final, you know, seminary education, you could say, to his. Uh, to his apostles and, and beyond, probably up to 500 people he was sharing messages with. And then he ascended. And then on the 10th day after his ascension, the Holy Spirit came. And the Holy Spirit begins the church, or the Messianic age begins with the, with the Holy Spirit. So 50 days after Yeshua's resurrection on the Feast of First Harvest, it's really literally First Harvest, you can ask Roy, you can check the Hebrew and Leviticus, even though we call it first fruits, it's first harvest. And then Shavuot, 50 days later, the Holy Spirit came, or first fruits, um, the Feast of Weeks. And so 50 days after Yeshua's resurrection, the Holy Spirit comes and we, we have the birth of, of the body of Messiah. And, and that's called the Messianic Age or the Age of the Church. And this, is, this whole period is a gap between the 69th week when Yeshua entered Jerusalem and died for our sins and rose again, and the, 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 this is a gap, and the 70th week when the great tribulation will begin. Now, Yeshua said, in this world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. So we as believers are not free from persecution and suffering, but we are persecuted and suffering not necessarily for our sins, but really for our witness. At least that's I know this can sound a little strange, but that's the goal. The goal is that the suffering that we do, the persecution, the tribulation that we face is for our witness and our testimony. We're willing to brave difficult arenas for the glory of God. And when we do suffer and are persecuted for our sin, then we, we should be quick to confess and repent. And of course, the Bible says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And so... The messianic age, the gap year, the body of the gap season, as uh, some people call it, begins with really the giving of the Holy Spirit. But when does it end? And that's as we're coming to Daniel chapter 12. When does it end? It ends with the rapture. The rapture, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 to 18. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. It's interesting, the voice of the archangel. We're going to see in Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, that the, the, the angel Michael also seems to be around during this time, and so maybe it's his voice. With the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Messiah will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. And so this gap, let me go back real quick here. This gap starts with the giving of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2, Pentecost in the Greek, Shavuot in the Hebrew, and will end with the rapture. Now, some people believe, in, and this is not a message on the rapture. We'll talk a little bit more about that, I'm sure, in weeks to come. But some people, will, there's a little bit of debate or, or discussion about when the rapture begins. I, for, for one, I, for one, believe that the rapture, in many ways, is, could be a type of trigger for these coming events. 
Because Paul says, and I read it last week, so I won't read it again, but it's 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, I believe verse 4. He talks about the restrainer being lifted, that all these events that are going to happen will happen when the restrainer is gone. Well, who's the restrainer? There's, of course, debate. And that is one of the issues. You know, that's why people aren't necessarily so dogmatic about these end times, these end time events. But the restrainer um, I've come to believe, is the Ruach HaKodesh in us. That we really, in many respects, if you kind of look, and I'm not calling, this is the, to the glory of God, not to the glory of, of, of ourselves, but if you sort of look out in the landscape, what is really holding back the tide? And, and I know we criticize ourselves. We say, well, maybe we're not doing as well as we could. And that's certainly something to be considered. But when you think about it, when the, the, when the body of Messiah is lifted out of the world, then there is, it, it kind of makes sense that the world will fall more into darkness. First, just because there may be up to, and it depends upon the numbers and what you look at, but there may be up to two and a half billion believers. That would be the high water mark. There could be as low as one to 1.5. I don't know how many believers are there are, but they're, they're in the billions. And if you lift these people out of the world, and these, you know, believers, we're seeking, we may not be doing very well at it, but we're seeking to live for God, we're seeking to believe in glory, we're seeking by the power and the grace of the Lord to live holy, righteous lives, lives like Daniel, lives like Esther, people we've just talked about recently, who are seeking the moral good and worth of the scriptures through the power of the Holy Spirit as a light, as a testimony, not to boast, we're not saved by works, but we're saved for works. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. And so when, when we disappear or when we are lifted up in the rapture, and that's why I, I believe in the imminency of the rapture. I'm, I'm more on the premillennial. That means that there's going to be a future thousand year reign and that pre-trib, you know, pre-trib meaning it could happen after the sign of the covenant or before, but somewhere early in the 70 when the 70th week begins. And part of the reason for that, there's really two reasons for that. One is what I've already shared. That it, to me, I know people are looking for a Gog and Magog war, some war that's going to trigger the 70 year, um, uh, 70 year, the 70th week and the beginning of the tribulation. And that, that's possible. I'm not saying that that's not possible. And I've heard I've heard people talk about that, and certainly there may be a war early that triggers the signing of a covenant, which I'll talk about in a moment. But I believe even more that it's this, this restrainer being lifted and the chaos that will ensue. And not just the physical chaos, because there's two billion people potentially that are not doing their jobs, they're not reporting for work the next day. Can only imagine what that would look like. You know people who aren't helping turn the lights on and fix the roads and do surgeries, etc. Where are these people going? And that's going to cause um, alarm, but also the moral chaos of people who are seeking to do good to others and also make sure good is done and keeping holding people accountable themselves first, that when those individuals are gone, then there will be more darkness. And so that could, could happen. The second is, is that it does say, Paul says in first Thessalonians chapter five, verse nine, he says that we, the believers are not appointed to wrath. We're not appointed to wrath. Now that's in the context of first Thessalonians four sixteen through 18, talking about the rapture. And then he comes comfort with these words. And then he goes on to say, you're not appointed to wrath. Now that doesn't mean again, that we're not going to experience persecution. She said, in this world, you will have tribulation. Take heart, I've overcome the world. But it's not the great tribulation of judgment. Now, I wanted to say, lastly, that people will say, well, you know, it sounds like we're getting a bailout. The world's going bad. We're getting a bailout. And that some believers who believe in the same way I do are also looking at like, well, I, it's, everything's going terrible. Hallelujah. The Lord's going to bail, you know, bring me out, and I don't have to put up with it. I don't think that's the right attitude or the right perspective. I think the right perspective is, is, first of all, we should be very sad in a sense. Why? Because the world is appointed judgment. At some point, what this is saying is at some point, those that are just not going to repent, 
and those that are con- continue to persecute the people of God. At some point, God is going to decide that the nations that are, that have, and the time that he's allotted for the going out of the gospel is going to be over. And when that time ends, then there will be judgment on those that are not responsive to the gospel message. And so instead of us going, well, thankfully, it'll all be over soon. No, we should redouble our efforts. You will not be appointed to wrath. You may suffer under the hands of sinful people as you, uh, as you declare the gospel. Hallelujah. Amen. Should not, we should not fear that. Amen. And I'm not saying, well, I, I don't fear it. You know, I, I'm just like you. I'm mortal. I'm concerned too. But, but for the sake of the judgment that's coming, the, the bridge that's out, we should be preaching the gospel because there is going to be future judgment. And I hope it's small, you know, and I hope you do too. I hope it's not going to be like, oh, everyone. Um, But we want, we we know that God has appointed time and that's really what the 70th week. It's a time to bring Israel to repentance and it's a time to to bring Israel to repentance and, and really even those that miss the rapture. But are willing to repent during the tribulation. So Israel as a nation and also individuals who do not know the Lord, who miss the rapture, that generation. And we're going to see everything is pretty much in place for a rapture to happen. I'm not saying it's going to happen tomorrow, but everything could be in place in terms of knowledge in the world, Israel back into the land. The, the temple's not yet rebuilt, but that can be rebuilt during the tribulation, but pieces are there. Jerusalem is under Israeli control, or at least partially. And so the question is, are you ready? Are you ready for the Lord's return? Now, there's two questions you have to ask yourself. Are you a follower of Yeshua? Have you put your faith in him? Have you confessed your sins? And not just, oh, yeah, sure, I've sinned. I'm not as good as God, so I guess I should be you know, praying this prayer. No. Do you recognize that you, you have violated his holy righteous standards? That the reason for your struggles, your problems, the problems of this world is because we've rejected God's holiness. And that we need to confess and repent. And you know, I will tell you, for your own personal healing and welfare, the more specific you can get, the better off you will be. Now, I get, I'm not saying you should get a bullhorn and, and just you know, declare it to the world, but at least to the Lord to really repent and turn to him. That's part of being ready. Part of being ready is to turn and repent and put your faith and trust in him. And so I want to encourage you today, if you have not yet done that, and, and not just like for a, a get out of jail free card, but to say, not only am I repenting, I'm, I'm renouncing my old ways, but I am going to glorify you. I'm going to bring you glory with my life. I, I desire that. Whether it's, going around the world and preaching the gospel, or whether it's serving him right here at Yeshua, they're both equal on the side of the Lord. It's the heart motive. And so are you ready? Have you put your faith? Have you put your trust in Yeshua? And so I want to encourage you to do that today. I want to encourage you to do that, not just as a, well, I'd like to be raptured, but as a, I believe he's my creator. He's my king. He died for me and rose again. And I, I, that, and I, I have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. And so if you haven't yet done that, I want to encourage you to do that. And I want to encourage you to come forward. And also, who are the people to be ready also is to be equipped. Are you serving the Lord at this point in time during this season? So I want to encourage you to do that as well. Which brings us to the time of the tribulation time of the tribulation. So in our final moments here, we're going to go through some general observations of the time of the tribulation. And that's a picture of Jerusalem in 70 AD uh, or 586, the time of tribulation. And so the tribulation is going to be greater, the Bible says. Now, a couple of quick things. The tribulation. So these are some general principles that you can have that Daniel talked about in his book. I'm not going into all the details of other books or the book of Revelation. We're doing that and we'll see more of the detail, but at least general principles for the great tribulation that's coming. The tribulation will begin with a treaty, Daniel 9, and he shall make a strong covenant with many for one week. So as I've already laid out, I don't want to beat a dead horse, but 
during this, this is the Messianic age or the age of the church, the church age. And at some point, could be with the Gog-Magog war, it could be with the rapture, there will be a treaty, that there will be the rise of this anti-Messiah that we talked about last week, and he will help orchestrate the signing of a covenant, of a treaty. B, the tribulation will trouble Israel. It will be a problem for Israel, a big problem uh, for the Jewish people, national Israel. But the good news is that this will be a catalyst that will bring national Israel to salvation and also judgment upon those who are who are persecuting the Jewish people, which brings us back to Genesis chapter 12. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who curse you. And we're seeing that covenant and that theme play out from the beginning all the way to the end. Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. At that time shall arise Michael. So we talked about this archangel, the great prince who's charge of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble. And this is, this is also an allusion to Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 7 to 9 where it talks about Jacob's trouble, Jacob's trouble. And so Jacob's trouble is going to be fully fulfilled in the 70th week, such as never has been since there was a nation till that time. And so this is parallel also with Revelation chapter 12, verse 7 to 17, where there's a war in the heavenlies that really you could say started at the beginning and is finishing where Satan is cast down and it's his final act. He, he, he's completely dethroned. He's no longer in a sense, the prince of the air. He's he, the war is coming to a conclusion in the heavenly realms. And he is now fight, fit, fighting his final battle here on earth. And he is taking out his, the misery that he causes on the Jewish people, probably because we're not the body of Messiah is not here. And so, but also because he hates the Jewish people, because God loves the Jewish people, and Satan, Hasatan, loves uh, everything God hates and hates everything God loves. He's a liar, a deceiver, and a murderer. And so, this is a time of trouble for the Jewish people. And so, we need to pray for the Jewish people. We need to pray for them uh, that many will come to faith, uh, hopefully before this time, but also during this time. Tribulation will continue with a sacrilege or a blasphemy. Um, it will, and, and I want to just say that when the, the 70 weeks, uh, the 70 weeks is divided in two. And the first half of the 70 weeks is called the time of sorrow. And that's sort of the beginning of tribulation where, where sorrow and those could be in the book of Revelation. Those seal judgments are coming and being delivered and part of the trumpet judgments are being delivered. But the final three and a half weeks is really the great tribulation, those 1260 days, which we'll see in a moment. And that's most likely the end of the trumpet judgments and the beginning of the bowl judgments. And so, and that's, that's when this sacrilege, this blasphemy in the middle. So the middle of those seven years, that 70th week, that seven year unit the first three and a half years is a time of sorrow where the anti-Messiah is more like a political leader. And then that second is where the anti-Messiah is fully and completely um, a demonic entity that is declaring himself to be God in the flesh. And that's why we call him anti-Messiah and demanding of worship. And so Daniel talks about this in Daniel chapter 9. And for half of the week he shall put an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abomination shall come one who makes desolate. And so this tribulation, and we know if we go back to Antiochus IV as our type, then we know that it's somebody who will be in the Holy of Holies who will be declaring himself to be, to be God. And this, of course, will bring on the, the great tribulation that is being talked about where it will be worse than, than ever, which is hard to believe because, of course, the Jewish people have suffered so much over the last 2,000 years, and yet this last 1,260 days will be um, horrific during this time, but it will at least lead um, to national Israel's salvation. Also, going back really quickly to Daniel chapter 12, it talked about Michael, Michael the archangel, and so, so Yeshua has his angels, has his archangel, and a lot of his, his instructions are being done through through him and and you know I thought about that and I'm like why is the archangel here and I I think part of that is because 
And we make the false dual belief where it's Yeshua and Satan, and they're battling it out like this. But really, it's Yeshua, Satan. And so his archangel is his representative to fight Satan. They're, in other words, they're not on equal planes. He's up here, and Satan has been allowed to do certain things that ultimately lead to the glory of God. And now uh, the archangel Michael, who is like God, that's what Michael means, he is God's representative uh, during this final seven weeks, seven years. Tribulation will end in judgment, Daniel 9, 27, until the decreed end is poured out on the desolator. And so the great tribulation does have a finite time, a finite time. And so let's look at this. Here's this, here's this uh, diagram. And I have a lot of diagrams here for Virginia in honor of you and National Administrator's Day because she told me that she likes diagrams, yeah. pictures. So I, I do too. I like a good map, a good diagram. Even though I don't necessarily understand them all, it's okay. Uh, I like, and so we see again, you know, the first three and a half years, and you can see I have the picture rapture in that corner there and rapture because that'll be early in the tribulation or early in the seven year period, or maybe even right before it, as I said, a potential trigger or down below, you see the Gog and Magog war as a potential trigger to start this, this last seven year treaty. And then three and a half years later, there is a, a breaking of the covenant. And also in Daniel chapter 11, there may be in the middle period that Egypt war. Some believers, scholars believe that in the middle, the Egypt war that's mentioned in Daniel chapter 11, verse 38 and 39 that we read last week, maybe at this time. And then we have the great tribulation period, that three and a half year period. And that three and a half year period is also 1260 days, which we're going to see mentioned. So that's a little, that's kind of another overview. So everything that kind of I was sharing, maybe it's kind of rumbling around a little bit there. What did he mean by, well, so this is hopefully going to kind of bring things back to the, the basics and the general principle of the, the tribulation. And so the tribulation will end with deliverance. So those that are not raptured, which will be sadly um, Jewish people, national Israel. Now I want to pause there and say that Prior to the rapture, there is a remnant. And God doesn't put a number on the remnant. Romans chapter 11, verse 5, the apostle Paul says that there is a remnant by grace of Jewish people that are coming to faith. There's always been Jewish people that have come to faith in Yeshua from the first century all the way to the present time. And I've heard that there are more Jewish people believing in Yeshua now than at any time since the first century. So we don't have to just say, well... National Israel, they're, they're going to be in the tribulation, so we're done. No, we need to pray for the remnant. We need to pray for individuals who don't yet know the Lord, both Jew and Gentile, to come to faith. And I want to just say this too, that one of our problems, I think, as believers when it comes to sharing the faith and evangelism is that we sort of prejudge people. Oh, that person will never come to faith. Oh, I, I'm really wasting my time over here with that person. I want to just encourage you, whether you think that person is going to come to faith or not, that's not really for us to decide. What's for us to decide is to, to minister. And even if that person doesn't want, you know, they've already told you for the umpteenth time, don't bring up Yeshua anymore. I don't want to hear it. You can still minister to them. You, you can be, you can be, dare I say, the heaven in their life. Mm -hmm. We hope that they come to faith. We want them to come to faith. That's between them and God. But if they don't, Lord forbid, you can, and, and again, I'm saying this as a, as a picture, as a metaphor, because we don't write anybody off, but you can be the heaven in their life. You can be the person in their life. You can be somebody in their life that even if they heap scorn upon you, you can put love on them. And, and, and you can just do what, what God has. And it's going to be the power. It's, look, I get it. For, with some people, it's the power of the Holy Spirit that will allow you to be the loving, sacrificial lamb in that person's life. Yes. And, you know, it's okay. We get it. I get it. I understand. You, we don't have to defend ourselves and fight over everything. We could, 
we could just say, you know what, I'm going to love this person. Hopefully, prayerfully, the love and ministry I give them will be a testimony to them to come to faith. But ultimately, it's up to the Lord. And I'm not doing it because, in, 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 to see if it works. I'm doing it because this is the ministry that God put in my life. And so, that being said, the tribulation will end with deliverance. Those that don't make it into the rapture, those that are in the tribulation, let's say tomorrow's the rapture or this Rosh Hashanah, we're all raptured. There's going to be uh, over 5 billion people, maybe 6 billion people left here. And those individuals, there will be deliverance for them that come to faith. It will be more difficult. It will be more difficult um, than it is during the, the age of Messiah, the Messianic age, the age of the body of Messiah. But there will be people who will come to faith. Verse 1, but, as, but at that time your people shall be delivered, everyone whose name shall be found written in the book of life. So there are people who will still be written in the book of life. National Israel or those Jewish people who are left behind will have the opportunity and they will by decree. Romans 11 verse 25 says a partial hardening has come to the Jewish people, to Israel, until the fullness of the nations come in. Which is a, a number, but it's also the, what is the fullness? could be the rapture. He could be sort of alluding to it when the fullness come in and many, and then all Israel will be saved. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Some will die during the tribulation as martyrs. There will be revival during the tribulation. I believe that. And many of them will die as martyrs and they will awake too. They will awake at the end those that have died, both believers in the tribulation, saints and unbelievers, some to everlasting life and some to everlasting contempt. And those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky above. And so they will enter into God's glory and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Some of them will be blessed because they will, they will, have, they will be confronted with pure evil and they will be rewarded for standing strong. So, you know, if, if I am part of that rapture generation and I am ministering to some stiff-necked individual, Jew or Gentile, it doesn't matter. Somebody who's like, I'm ministering to them. I'm doing my best. I'm trying to share the love of God. They're not coming to faith. Then I get raptured. And then after that, while they're in the, the tribulation, they come to faith. And by God's grace, they're strong and they're leading people to salvation. So we could have that kind of ministry if we are the final generation. Amen. That's exciting, right? Yes. So even if we're not in the tribulation, you're pre-disciples. And we don't want it that way. We want everybody to be part of it. But if they don't, for whatever reason, you and I can, can be, you and I can have an influence even then. The tribulation will end with the information age. And what I mean by that is, and I alluded to this earlier, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but... The age we're in right now is an age that is ready for the rapture and the tribulation in that final week of Daniel because of information. He says in Daniel 12, verse 4, but you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book. So we know from Daniel that it's not going to happen during his, he's shutting it up. And then at the end of the book of Revelation, it's opening. You know, even in Revelation uh, chapter 6, when they start to open the scrolls, it's sort of like opening the seal. And so it's this, that, that the events are, are coming. But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall increase. And we certainly are in an information age. Knowledge is increasing. And so Israel's back in the land. Jewish people are in control of Jerusalem. And knowledge is increasing. These are some of the items that are being, have been fulfilled that also mean that this time, the 70th week, is, is near, is nigh. Tribulation will end in 1260 days. I've already said this, that last three, that's what three and a half years is. It's, it's 1260 days. Now, the whole week is 1260 plus 1260, right? Whatever that number is. Somebody wants to blurt it out, they can Let's see, carry the one, what is that, 2520? But that half, so the first half, time of sorrows, time where the anti-Messiah is this political leader that is growing in power, and he goes through a lot of 
A lot of issues, a lot of transformations that we'll talk about in the book of Revelation. And then the last three and a half years is when he is completely consumed by evil fully and attacks those that do not bow the knee, national Israel, Jewish people, and those uh, part of the nations as well. So Daniel chapter 12, verse 5, Then I, Daniel, looked, and behold, two others stood, one on the bank of the, of the stream and one on the bank of of the stream. So two others, so these angels, and someone said to the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the stream, how long shall it be till the end of these wonders? And I heard the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the stream. He raised his right hand and his left hand toward heaven and swore by him who lives forever that it would be for a time, times, and half a time. And when, and that when the shattering of the power of the holy people comes to an end, all these things would be finished. And I take that to mean that, that tw at the end of the 1260 days, we'll see the fulfillment of Zechariah chapter 12, verse 9 and 10. That Israel will completely, finally give up its own ability, surrender, recognize. And, and in that surrender, they recognize their sin. Zechariah 12, verse 10 says, They will look upon me whom they pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for a firstborn son. And so it's the giving up, you know, and, and, and the, the, the context of that is Jerusalem is being surrounded. And, and God will come in and, and deliver them at this time. And so they will sadly suffer. Many will come to faith and national Israel will repent. And, and it really is an application for us as followers. We're not just called to surrender and we're not just called to repent we're called to do both we're called to repent of our sin and surrender and that's what national israel does at the end in zechariah chapter 12 verse 10 and so i believe that that happens here at the end of the tribulation period but also by application it happens all the time i mean many people come to faith because they look upon the pierced one and that's one of, as I've shared in the past, that's one of the ways in which Yeshua is known to the world. He's known to the world as a suffering servant of Isaiah who was pierced for our transgression. He's known as the one who died for us on the cross. Psalm 22, they pierced my hands and my feet. And so throughout the ages, one of the, the ways in which Yeshua is, re is recognized is because he's the pierced one. The tribulation will end with Israel's salvation. I heard, but I did not understand. Then I said, oh, my Lord, what shall be the outcome of these things? He said, go your way, Daniel, for the words are shut up and sealed until the time of the end. So we have a time of trouble. We have the time of the end. I believe this is the fourth time. The time of the end is mentioned. Many shall purify themselves and make themselves white and be refined, but the wicked shall act wickedly. And none of the wicked shall understand, but those who are wise shall understand. And from the time that the regular burnt offering is taken away and the abomination that makes desolate is set up, there shall be 1,290 days. Now, there's an additional 30 days. And that's kind of like, well, where's this additional? Because if you go 1,260, but now he's saying 1,290, what's those 30 days? I, my, I, I believe, and there are, there are a number of people, as Pastor Michael liked to say, godly people agree to disagree but these 30 days, there's two events that are still to happen before the millennium. And I've always kind of felt like they happen more instantaneously. But it seems like in the book of Daniel, they happen over a, a period of time. And one is Israel's salvation. So Israel being saved, and that may be more than a moment's notice. Or it might be with the battle of Armageddon that it takes a certain amount of time for that to ultimately play out. And then for the installation of the millennial kingdom, the beginning, the preamble of that beginning. And so we see first this 30 days, the end of the abomination of desolation and the reign of Antichrist. That war at the end will take 30 days to administer. And then the installation, the beginning of the millennial kingdom, the organization of the world and Israel's um, fulfillment of their right to the, to the land. And that takes an additional 45 days. Because then he says in Daniel chapter 12, Blessed is he who waits and arrives at the, 13, at the 1335 days. But go your way till the end. 
and you shall rest and shall stand in your allotted place at the end of days. And so you have 1260 days. That's that three and a half year period. That's the reign of anti-Messiah. Then you have that 30 day period where Israel is delivered, saved. And then you have an additional 45 day period where the kingdom is installed, that thousand year reign of Messiah and the, 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 the sons of David on the throne. And also the rest of the world is, is organized into this kingdom uh, life. And so there are individuals who have different takes on this, and then there's different eschatological systems. We at Adat Yeshua, we are premillennial. We are, in other words, again, we believe that there's a literal thousand-year reign that is going to come at the, after the end of the 70th week of Daniel. And so this is uh, that layout. These are these principles that will occur during and after the 70th week of Daniel. And that's really the final chapter of the book of Daniel. That's his final, that's got, so here we have again, this young man started somewhere at 15, 14, 15, 16, all the way into his 90s now. He, he served kings, he served empires, and during that time, he received powerful messages from the Lord, from the Holy Spirit, for God's glory. And again, what's so fascinating about these final messages is that he received them most likely after the lion's den. You know, that God, you know, in his, in his elderly state, after the lion's den, God showed him these messages. And so that's very uh, powerful. And so here we have a final diagram on the, the left side there, we have the 69 weeks that lead up to the death, burial, and resurrection of Yeshua. And then we have the, 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 the church age, as we've called it, the messianic age, then the rapture, and then the final week. Again, the, that final week, the first three and a half years, the time of sorrows, the second three and a half years, the great tribulation, the reign of anti-Messiah and... Um, and, and Satan through anti-Messiah, and then ultimately the establishment of, of Israel's salvation, which I, which I read from Romans 11, and then ultimately the kingdom. And then after that thousand years, we have the, the eternity, the new heaven and the new earth. And so, with that, it's the call to witness. Let's we'll close with the call to witness. I know, and sometimes I do. I mean, maybe I'm a broken record. You know, that record that just kind of keeps playing that same song. Um, but we are called to witness. You know, and in the call to witness, it's not just sharing the gospel message of 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4 that Paul lays out so nicely. And I'm not deme demeaning that. That's a beautiful thing. And I pray we share that often. But the call to witness is also, or in addition to that beautiful, simple, yet not simplistic gospel message, the call to witness is also the call to grow spiritually, to allow our testimony to be more and more defined and glorify God, and to surrender more of our will to God so that we will live out His will and to allow Him to reveal more and more what he has for us. So that, so we say the call to witness. And, and as I close, I want to just say that we may very well be the final generation. And I don't believe it's because we failed as the body of Messiah. Although I get it. We could, you know, Church of Laodicea, that lukewarm church, and there are areas that are lukewarm, but it's also, but, and, and maybe we are part of a, a season where the body of Messiah is not all it can be. But that doesn't mean that we can't. Just because the greater body is struggling or having its issues, it doesn't mean that you and I can't, we can't be all that the Lord has called us to be. And, and we can't serve him. Uh, because this is, the, this is the only life on this side of eternity that we've been given. And this is the season that we're living and so we don't have to be defeatist or fatalist. We can just say, you know what? Until the Lord returns, until I'm called to be with him, I will serve him with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. And I will love others um, the way he's loved me. Let's pray. Abba Father, thank you so much.
for our time. Thank you for our time together, Lord. Thank you for this beautiful service this morning. Thank you for Chris and Hannah and Aisha and their child. We pray blessing, Lord, on their baby. We pray healthy, beautiful baby. We pray you just continue to provide for them and open up doors for them to minister your truth. Thank you that they are young and strong uh, in you and ready to serve you. And Lord, I pray for all of us that we too would, would continue to answer that call uh, to bring you glory and to see many souls come to faith. And so, Father, we pray and thank you in advance for all that you're doing in and through us. I pray, Lord, if there's anyone who does not yet know you, that they would put their faith and trust in you. And, Father, I pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Those that are hurting Israel, cursing Israel, I pray they would repent and they would be turned to you and that, they would, that their, 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 their cursing would end. And I pray, Lord, for the Jewish people who don't yet know you to turn to you and believe. And I thank you, Lord, and pray for the fullness of the nations. I pray for many people to come to faith. And thank you that that's your heart, that none should perish. In Yeshua's name, amen. Amen.